From the world of politics to the world of business, this is Balance of Power. Live from Washington, D.C. From Bloomberg's Washington, D.C. studios to our TV audiences worldwide, welcome to Balance of Power. Alongside Anne-Marie Hordern, I'm Joe Matthew. Diplomatic breakthrough, Secretary of State Antony Blinken plans to visit Beijing in the coming weeks, even as things remain tense between the superpowers. Anybody who just wants to put our head in the sand and assumes that uh, Xi Jinping will change his behavior is dangerously naive. In that way, I don't have a problem with Secretary Blinken continuing to talk to the Chinese about American values and about how we will work to defend them. We'll get reaction from Jane Harmon, chair of the Commission on the National Defense Strategy and former Democratic Congresswoman from California. Major dam is destroyed in Ukraine, both sides blaming each other, and major implications on the harvest and a Russian-occupied nuclear plant. Meantime, new questions arising in Congress today about funding for Ukraine. We'll hear from Democratic Representative Dan Kildee of Michigan. And Chris Christie enters the Republican presidential ring tonight. Will the combative former governor of New Jersey be able to take any ground from former President Donald Trump? That is the big question, Anne Marie. He's making the big announcement an hour and a half from now in Battleground, New Hampshire. We'll talk about that, of course, a little bit more with our political panel as we gauge what's happening on the campaign trail here for 2024. But a major story that you brought to us from China today by way of the State Department, Anthony yeah. Blinken's packing his bags. Well, remember, this was the trip that was supposed to happen, and then it was derailed by the alleged Chinese spy balloon across the continental U.S., mm -hmm. but it is a massive deal for this administration. They've been asking the Chinese for to sit down with their counterparts, and now they're going to get it with Secretary of State yeah. Blinken. Will it be a precursor to a meeting between the two presidents? That's a good question. And also, potentially on this trip, we actually will see Blinken sitting down with Xi Jinping. Mm -hmm. Maybe not even a meeting. We're supposed to have a phone call. <laughs> yeah, let's and that see has yet to be scheduled. All right, exactly. joining us around the table to discuss all of this is Bloomberg's economics reporter and a current and deputy managing editor, Wendy Benjaminson. Wendy, let's take both of these two stories. So we have Chris Christie this evening, uh, a acolyte at one point, then a foe of the former president. That's right. And then at the same time, at all this happening, the administration is trying to tampen the rhetoric, I think, on China. It's fair to say. At least they want meetings. How difficult is that when you're gearing up for a presidential election and the individual, the country that every leader, <laughs> politician wants to attack is yep. going to be Beijing? That's right. It is going to be tricky. And the difference, really, between the two parties here is who wants to yell about it more. In fact, Jamie Dimon, uh, chairman of J.P. Morgan Chase, was on the Hill today and said we sh there shouldn't be so much yelling and threatening. He was glad to see the administration engaging with Beijing on this. Mm -hmm. um, now, of course, Beijing has been less than polite to Defense Secretary Lloyd Austin, refusing to meet with him and other um, you know, setbacks. And, and they've been arguing about whether these flights that were dangerous, you know, planes crossing closely in front of each other, and whose fault was that? Right. Mm -hmm. And so, but going into the election, I think it will be um, who can be the most hawkish on China. But I also think voters want to see a steady hand, responsible hand, mm -hmm. and not war. So they will, they, even if they're being hawkish, I think they will try, the Democrats are being hawkish, I think they will try to sound reasonable and responsible. We all remember uh, Barack Obama talking with Dmitry Medvedev, I'll have more flexibility after the election. <laughs> and uh, to what extent will politics here at home drive the conversation, or at least the way Joe Biden frames the conversation himself? Well, I think it's going to be interesting to see how China responds to this. It seems to me that the U.S. government have been making some overtures in recent weeks with the certain officials going out there to speak and the handshake in Singapore, etc. Yeah. But the, the mood music coming out of Beijing hasn't been reciprocated especially warmly. We heard those remarks from the defense minister from China in Singapore on Sunday, very strident, very pugnacious comments towards China. We had those two ships having that encounter in the South, yes, right. outside China Seas. So uh, I think maybe the U.S. is trying to calm things down here to get uh, to get us back on an even keel, but I think a, a lot remains to be seen to how China will respond to this. Yeah, certainly will, and not even how China will respond. But after Blinken, is there going to be any more overtures? Will Secretary Yellen go? Will Raimondo go? I mean, mm -hmm. even though she had a meeting here with her counterpart. Um, we did get the reaction from Republican Congressman Dusty Johnson speaking on the Hill early this morning. Take a listen. 
No sane person wants a hot war with China, and even a cold war could be a, a huge problem. Anybody who just wants to put our head in the sand and assumes that uh, Xi Jinping will change his behavior is dangerously naive. In that way, I don't have a problem with Secretary Blinken continuing to talk to the Chinese about American values and about how we will work to defend them. And how difficult is it for American businesses to navigate this relationship? Obviously, on the economic front, massive trade between the two, a record last year. But just today, we saw Sequoia is actually moving their Chinese business in a separate entity. And a lot of that has to do with the regulatory environment. It's getting more complicated. Even the Chambers of Commerce in China complain about how difficult it is to do business there. Sequoia itself, now they didn't allude to geopolitics in their statement. They said they're, they're going separate ways because of internal overlap and marketing issues and decentralized back offices and the like. But we know that Sequoia is one company in the middle of the crosshairs of investing in sensitive areas in China's economy that the US government, of course, is trying to restrict investment into. As I say, they didn't explicitly say that, but lots of people are interpreting. You can read the tea leaves. Yeah, and there's people are saying, look, Sequoia separating his business here because partly of what's going on in the geopolitical scene. They're not the only ones. Plenty of business people are saying it's harder to do business now in China and with the U.S. Well, so I guess a, a, a greater question than Wendy, politically speaking here, geopolitically speaking here, for this administration, what does it want from China? We know what it does not want. It doesn't want a war. As the president <laughs> says, competition, not conflict. But what could he walk away with to make this worth everyone's while? Well, I think he could walk away with, um, you know, a, a tamping down of some of the aggressive behavior. He could see some real engagement on um, business and uh, other diplomatic fronts. He could, I mean, he could wish for, he's not going to get, some movement on human rights yeah. or, or other issues like that. But I think if he just could demonstrate a calming of these tensions, a lack of saber rattling, a lack of planes and ships flying in each other's way, I think that would, um, that would show the sort of steady hand I was talking about earlier. Um, of course, for the business community, one of the most important aspects of this relationship is the e economy. Right. This, these are two largest economies. And on that front, we do have um, key NBER indicators. Don't rule out a second half recession in the United States. That's right. Um, everyone's talking about whether or not we're going to see a recession or end up uh, partially because it's very difficult. How do you have a recession with 3.7% unemployment? but potentially there is one next year. What are you seeing in the data? Oh, look, this U.S. recession story keeps getting pushed back, right? As people <laughs> saying, it's, it's out there somewhere, but where is it? It's interesting, actually. The U.S. economy is very strong at the moment. The jobs market is very strong. And China is weak, much weaker than expected. It was meant mm -hmm. to get this big post-COVID rebound, and that's not panning out. So I think, broadly speaking, people say the U.S. economy could pull off soft landing this year, but maybe yeah. next year those interest rates are causing pain, and maybe then that's when it does have a recession. And maybe that plays into the political story, too. To be clear, though, Bloomberg Economics says its current baseline is for a U.S. recession to start in the third quarter. Sure. Timing here is brutal if you're launching a political campaign. If you're Certainly Joe Biden, one for re-election around <laughs> yeah, that time. If you're Donald Trump or Ron DeSantis, not so bad. But that's if you're Joe opposite, Biden, it's, it's really not good news. And it's almost like... He probably is wishing for, if there's going to be a recession, for it to be in 2023 in the hopes that voters will forget way. it. Yes, get it out of the way. And hopes that voters will forget about it or be over it by, by summer of 24 when they really start tuning in. Mm -hmm. But if we are in, a, in an enduring recession and just slogging through a slowed economy into 2024, that is not good for the Democrats. Well, Apollo's calling it, or they see the U.S. having a non-recession recession. recession. And I, like I, I don't really know what that means. Because <laughs> it means we're technically in one, but we're just not feeling the impact, say, as you know, greater ones in the past? Well, people also refer to the rolling recession. Uh, Eddie Ardenny, mm -hmm. for example, has come up with that line. It's basically some parts of the economy are in pain. Actually, the manufacturing sector is feeling the hit quite badly at the moment. Yeah. Export orders, new orders, the ISM indicators showing that. Other sectors in the services area are doing quite well. And that's the kind of dichotomy people are, are talking about. Overall, things are okay, pretty good, but certain, some sectors are feeling pain. And the job market hangs in there, I guess, to keep everybody afloat, even Very if the strong. economy is contracting somehow. I don't know how long that can go on for And try putting non-recession recession on a bump. <laughs> yeah, we'll work on that. <laughs> Wendy Benjaminson and Enda Curran, many thanks for your thoughts to get us started here on Balance of Power. Coming up, the Securities and Exchange Commission talking the next step in a growing crypto crackdown. Enter Coinbase. More on that conversation next on Balance of Power on Bloomberg.
there are gaps in the regulatory framework. Gaps, and I think to protect the public. We need we need to fill that gap between the, the CFTC and the SEC. We have the opportunity for the SEC to have that control of securities, and we have the opportunity for the CFTC to really take control of commodities. Our bill is the right approach. I think we're all struggling on both sides of the aisle. What the SEC has done is only clouded this issue even more. Fascinating timing. What we do not want to see, though, is a administrative element like the SEC trying to empire build before we've even got the legislation to the floor. Members of the House Agriculture Committee speaking with Bloomberg's Kaylee Lines earlier today outside a hearing focused on crypto regulation. Yes, Agriculture Committee crypto. Mm -hmm. This after the SEC filed two major lawsuits, one against Binance yesterday and today it was Coinbase. Kaylee is here with more. What would you learn, Kaylee? Well, of course, the Ag Committee is involved in these crypto conversations in regard to how the CFTC ultimately should have regulatory authority here, mm -hmm. and they oversee uh, that regulator in particular. But that was really not the regulator in focus today. Instead, it's the SEC, which has brought yeah. this lawsuit against Coinbase, a public company, mind you, a publicly registered uh, exchange that fell 12% on the day as a result of this lawsuit. Granted, that was well off session lows. At one point, it was down as much as 21%. But essentially, what the SEC uh, is alleging here is that this company was operating an illegal exchange, violated securities laws by allowing users to trade tokens that were not registered as securities. And of course, the pushback you continually get from those in the industry, including Coinbase, is that it is incredibly unclear what is a security and what isn't, and that there isn't actually a process to come in and register with <laughs> the SEC as an exchange. Brian Armstrong, the CEO of Coinbase, put out a lengthy a tweet in response to this earlier today saying, instead of publishing a clear rule book, the SEC has taken a regulation by enforcement approach that is harming America. So if we need to avail ourselves to the courts to get clarity, so be it. And of course, they aren't the only company that could be heading to court on this. As you said, Joe, yesterday we got news that the SEC also filed suit against Binance, really a series of allegations. There are 13 civil counts in total, including wash trading, which is basically manipulating prices, uh, not being uh, honest with investors and regulators, mishandling, commingling customer funds. And then, yes, also breaking securities rules. So it's a lot to talk about here, and we got yeah. to do so, our colleague David Weston, earlier today when he spoke with the SEC chairman himself, Gary Gensler, about this. I think the crypto industry more broadly, if it's going to have any success going forward, has to come into compliance with basic public policy about disclosure, about avoiding conflicts, about segregating, properly segregating customer funds, and guarding against fraud and manipulation. But guys, I speak with players in the crypto industry all the time who say mm -hmm. coming into compliance is way easier said than done because the rules of the road here are just very unclear. Well, so I want to ask you, what is everyone else doing? These cannot be the only two companies. There are other crypto companies, and also there are individual Americans who trade. Yeah, there are, and this comes down to the consumer protection argument, which lawmakers on Capitol Hill who are pushing for legislation to set some regulatory barriers around crypto say this is ultimately about consumer protection. Otherwise, all of this activity goes offshore, it's out of your jurisdiction, and you lose the ability to provide that kind of uh, insulation mm -hmm. for U.S. customers and people who are trading these assets here in the U.S. That is really what this ad committee hearing was about earlier today, a market structure proposal that would really divvy up jurisdiction between the SEC over securities and then the CFTC over digital commodities and kind of the definitions and the classification of those that have proved really hard for Congress to actually get something through on. Yeah. It does feel like there is some more momentum, uh, momentum in that direction. This is a now. chairman who's received a lot of criticism, of course, uh, from the crypto world and a lot of particularly Republican members of Congress for his approach to this say they say he's playing whack-a-mole with mm -hmm. the crypto uh, industry today he compared this Coinbase uh, lawsuit he said it would be like the New York Stock Exchange running its own hedge fund and betting against its customers is he trying to, to, to put these companies out of business he's suggesting their business model is yeah. corrupt. Well, with Binance, they asked for an injunction. The idea that all of those assets would go into receivership, maybe halt yeah. the operations of the SEC. And we heard from Congressman Zach Nunn there, who was saying this is empire building on the part of Gary Gensler. He is trying to front run, essentially, Congress actually doing something legislatively. Oh. All right, Kaylee Lyons, thank Thanks, you so Kaylee. much for your work on the Hill today. You know, is it a currency or a commodity? Oh. Kaylee will tell a clip next. <laughs> <laughs> Coming up, Ukraine and Russia accusing each other of blowing up a giant dam and unleashing a huge catas catastrophe in the region. Then we've got a congressman, Dan Kildee of Michigan, joins us next.
got to do everything we can this year to ensure that Ukraine is, uh, is victorious in their uh, efforts to uh, push Russia out of Ukraine. I'm interested in making sure that the Ukrainians have the tools they need to defend their nation. As far as redoing the debt ceiling deal, that's going to be pretty, pretty problematic. It seems as though the Senate wants a redo of the deal that Speaker McCarthy and President Biden cut. Congressional leaders today butting heads over funding for Ukraine, speaking earlier with Bloomberg on Capitol Hill. House Speaker Kevin McCarthy is now opposing a push by Republican hawks, certainly those in the Senate, to expedite more funding for Ukraine and vowing to block any bill that undercuts the new caps on U.S. spending that bring us back to that debt ceiling bill that just passed. Democratic Congressman Dan Kildee of Michigan is here to talk about this and some other issues with us. Congressman, it's great to see you. Welcome back to Bloomberg TV. I wonder your thoughts on Thank this. You very much. Is, is this a, a couple of folks in the House making a lot of noise and getting coverage? Or is the Speaker of the House actually prepared to stop a supplemental request for more money in Ukraine? Well, that remains to be seen. Uh, first of all, we've committed to support the people of Ukraine and the Ukrainian government to, to beat back this terrible, uh, unprovoked aggression against them by Russia. And I think the, the consequence of failing to be there on their behalf would be felt not just for the next few years, but for generations to come. So that's a commitment we need to make. I think the question, of course, is what form does that take? What I don't want us to do, I, I, I su would support a supplemental that provides them the help they need. But what we don't want to do is reset the baseline for the Defense Department in the, in the moment when we're dealing with the Ukrainian issue and use that as an excuse to raise the baseline for future years when maybe this issue is no longer present. Uh, but I don't think the speaker's well, got it right in the sense that we need we need to be there for the people of Ukraine. Well, he's warning he won't allow a House vote on any Senate legislation that he considers is bumping up into the defense spending uh, caps that were organized by the negotiating team from the White House and the Republican side, his deputies. But at the same time, only reason why that bill was able to get through the Senate partially is because defense hawks were, their concerns were swayed that they would be able to have this supplemental. So does this mean that there's not going to be the votes in the House if a supplemental package was to pass in the Senate? Well, I think if there's a vote on the floor of the House for a supplemental package to support our efforts uh, to protect Ukraine from this terrible uh, action by Putin, my suspicion is that it would get a lot of support on both sides of the aisle. Uh, you know, I, I, the speaker, I think, is going to have to have some explaining to do as to why we wouldn't take that position. I do get the point that we need to hold to this agreement, but the agreement doesn't mean that when a circumstance arises, such as what we're seeing right now, this, this, mm -hmm. you know, this situation with Ukraine, that we can look the other way and say, well, we don't have the resources to help people that we really need to be supporting. Yeah. Congressman, we understand that 11 members of the Freedom Caucus who opposed the debt ceiling bill brought uh, business to a halt uh, for a time today on the House floor. How concerned are you about them exercising their power to make it difficult to do business in the House of Representatives or even have a speaker named Kevin McCarthy? I'm really concerned about it. And of course, this was predictable. Uh, back in January, on January 3rd, 4th, 5th, and 6th, we all watched. Hmm as Kevin McCarthy went through the process of making arrangements with people that can't be trusted. Uh, and now we're seeing the result of that. I mean, we're talking about the most outrageous members of Congress having more power over the agenda on the floor of the House of Representatives than the elected speaker. Now, I didn't vote for Speaker McCarthy, but right. the Republican majority needs to find a way to govern without handing the keys to the most outrageous members of their conference. And what we're seeing so would right you now vote is the him? result of those deals. For, for if he was to Speaker lose McCarthy? some members of his right flank, would you vote potentially with some other Democrats to keep him in place at the speakership? It's a good question, and I don't, I don't want to engage <laughs> in hypotheticals. All I can say is <laughs> that uh, we can't continue to be in a position where the Speaker allows to be held hostage by his own members and by a small number of them. What I would prefer is that he just simply say no. And then we'll see whether yeah. they bring uh, a motion to vacate the chair. And at that point in time, we'd have to evaluate all options. Congressman Kildee, I want to ask you about this lawsuit today filed by Merck uh, suing uh, the government here over this new law 
That is, it's actually a portion of the IRA, the Inflation Reduction Act, that would give the government uh, the authority to negotiate drug prices. So you're just back to your job in Congress after winning a battle against cancer, and you authored legislation to put caps on the price of insulin. Is this a lawsuit that could change the path here that Democrats are taking on prescription drug prices? I seriously doubt it. I mean, their claim, Merck's claim, that negotiating between a buyer and a seller is somehow unconstitutional because the purchaser happens to be the American government. Think about they called how it tantamount to extortion. But think about how that concept might play out in every other aspect of commerce that the American government engages in. For example, would we decide that defense contractors can't be negotiated with, that they can't compete over price? that we would just simply have to take whatever price they put on whatever product they sell us. This is the way a marketplace actually is intended to work. The buyer and the seller negotiate to a point where there's a fair price agreed upon. Now, I understand that they don't like it, but, I mean, this is a company that made $14 billion in profits last year. So I'm not sure they're the most sympathetic plaintiff in this case number one. And secondly, we've got the law on our side. The notion that the Constitution would prevent the American government from deciding that we're going to do, in this case, the same thing we do in other aspects of commerce that we engage in on a regular basis, including the purchase of pharmaceuticals and other aspects of the federal uh, uh, budget. To me, I yeah. think it's, a, it's an argument that doesn't go anywhere. Well, we'd love to talk to you as this unfolds here. And Congressman, we do want to welcome you back to Congress and to Bloomberg TV. Representative Dan Kildee of Michigan, we thank you. Coming up, we'll talk with Jane Harmon, the chair of the Commission on National Defense Strategy. But first, Anne-Marie, we've got a lot to dig in when it comes to Ukraine and your news today from China. Yeah, in Ukraine, that dam, the real concern has to be what this could mean for Zaporizhia, the biggest nuclear power That's plant right. in Europe. And then, yes, Blinken is going to China, finally, I guess, in the administration's eyes. We look forward to talking about it with Jane Harmon next. Stay with us on Balance of Power. This is Bloomberg. power on Bloomberg TV. So, Secretary of State Antony Blinken planning to visit China in the coming weeks as tensions simmer between the two nations. Joining us now is Jane Harmon, chair of the Commission on the National Defense Strategy. She's a former nine-term congresswoman from California who served as ranking member of the House Intelligence Committee. Congresswoman, thank you so much for your, for your time this evening. I want to start with that. That was uh, part of my reporting with Jenny Leonard this morning, Secretary of State Antony Blinken will be going in the coming weeks, likely in June, he'll be meeting his uh, counterpart likely, and possibly as well Xi Jinping. Remember, this trip was supposed to happen before the alleged spy balloon was flying over the continental U.S. What's the purpose? Is he trying to set the guardrails of this relationship? I think that's part of the purpose, but let me say I applaud the initiative by the Biden administration uh, to do three things at once with China. One is to confront China uh, when it is doing improper things in the South China Sea and otherwise. A second thing is to compete with China, and a third thing is to cooperate with China. And soft power uh, includes diplomacy, and I'm glad they've put this trip back together. And let me also commend our able ambassador to China, uh, Nick Burns, who has been there for over a year and trying uh, to make this diplomatic relationship work. So this is a good thing. Is the end game a sit down between the two presidents? Does Joe Biden want to have that one on one conversation, or do we need to see more from China, beginning with? these close encounters that are becoming very dangerous for our military. Yeah. Well, uh, let's understand, China is, as the Defense Department says, the pacing challenge. China does not want to be just like the United States. I think we made a big mistake after the Cold War. I wrote a book about this in thinking that China wanted to be us. China doesn't want to be us. China thinks it has yeah. an equal or, or certainly longer lasting civilization and wants to build something different. We have to be able to find the means 
uh, to have a relationship with China and with India, which also has some different views, and with other countries. Uh, it's a multipolar world. So, yes, I think there should be or could be a sit down at some point. Uh, but let's understand bashing China is cheap retail for both political parties, and they both mm. do it. Uh, oh, sure. And that's going to continue. And on the other side, uh, I guess bashing the U.S. is kind of cheap retail, too. <laughs> Well, I'm not so sure about that, but China for sure, Congresswoman, that is obviously the focal point for anyone, especially if you're running to be president of the United States in 2024. National Security Council spokesman yeah. John Kirby spoke about this earlier today about this relationship. Take a listen. I think anybody that's taken a look at this bilateral relationship, the most consequential bilateral relationship in the world right now, can see that the tensions are high. And we all want to see the tensions come down. And the president believes that the best way to do that is through diplomacy. And it boggles my mind that anybody anywhere would think, A, that we're not engaging in diplomacy, and B, that diplomacy and the use of it and the attempt at dialogue and diplomacy is somehow weakness. It just absolutely boggles my mind. Congresswoman, if diplomacy is so important, why didn't the Biden administration, and potentially maybe you have a thought on this, didn't lift those sanctions on the defense minister so he could sit down with his counterpart, Lloyd Austin, just a few days ago in Singapore? Uh, well, <laughs> uh, I don't know the, the precise answer to that, but I would say that we are trying to thread a needle here. I mean, China is, is provocative. Uh, China is, to some extent, helping Russia in, the, in its illegal war in Ukraine. Uh, China is uh, goading other parts of the world uh, to not be friendly, friendly to the U.S. And on the other hand, if we don't get along with China at all, and if we, as some claim, uh, provoke a war over Taiwan and so forth, I think we're making a big mistake. So this is difficult. And uh, let's, in this defense commission that I chair, we're trying to, to take a whole of government approach and understand that military might is a big part of our equation uh, to uh, mm -hmm. uh, show leadership in the world. But, it's, but our, 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 our engagements have to include uh, soft power, have to include AI, you know, aid, have to include uh, the private sector uh, and humanitarian efforts. I uh, have to speak to human rights in addition to just uh, building our defense might, which we have to do as well. Yeah. Jane, I want to get your read on what's happening in Ukraine. And a terrible story today as we see this massive dam uh, destroyed w with explosives. Both sides are blaming each other, but we can see the fallout here. The flooding is jeopardizing uh, the wheat crop, the harvest in Ukraine, along with the Zaporizhia nuclear plant. Here's Democratic Congressman Jim Costa we spoke with from California talking about this with Bloomberg earlier today, and we'll get your reaction. Weaponizing food, which is what Russia is doing by the, uh, you know, uh, explosives they placed on this dam is once again a, I think, a proof positive that President Putin's a war criminal, and he's willing to go to any lengths uh, to, uh, to um, you know, uh, when his uh, military is failing, uh, to try to save, um, you know, this this ad adventure to annex Ukraine. Assuming this was Russia, we do have a sense of how far yeah. Vladimir Putin is willing to go here, Jane, with regard to that nuclear power plant in Zaporizhia, the idea of this possibly melting down. Do you think that plant could yeah. dictate the way this war ends? Uh, I don't know how the war will end, but 300,000 people are now deprived of water uh, because of this act of mm -hmm. eco-terrorism yesterday, whoever did it, uh, likely Russia. Uh, and uh, I worry a lot about Zaporizhia. I worry that if, uh, I, I hadn't thought about water, be the dam breaking, but if, if yeah. the core melts down in Zaporizhia, and hopefully it won't, uh, it will contaminate the water supply for the whole area. Uh, and so this is uh, obviously probably the most dangerous spot in Ukraine right now. And the Russians have been reckless in shelling and bombing the place. And uh, they've removed their own folks. And so that worries me even more, wondering uh, what mm. might come next. I mean, let's, let's understand that, that what we have going for us is uh, this incredible fight by Ukraine. Who would have thought 
that the Ukrainian people could be this brave. We've also supplied them with weapons, but it is their tenacity and their cleverness that is keeping this war going. And I heard, uh, I was at Henry Kissinger's 100th birthday last night in New York. What a celebration. Huh. Uh, and, and by the way, the Chinese ambassador was there, the new one. Uh, uh, what a celebration. And the chatter was about how the Ukraine is back and how strong they are. And uh, we'll see. So I'm not ready to say the war's ending anytime soon. I hope it does, but it has to end on terms that are satisfactory to the Ukrainians. Congresswoman, very quickly, what was that interaction like from uh, Secretary Kissinger and the new Chinese ambassador? Well, I, I was chatting with him, too. I, I hadn't met him. Uh, I think it's a charm offensive here by him. It was a large crowd of all the right people. And uh, I, I uh, hope that this is part of uh, some outreach by the Chinese as well as outreach by us. I mean, let's have, let's walk this the hot relationship back to m milder, which doesn't excuse the Chinese from, from provocative mm -hmm. actions. I don't want to say that. But it also gives an opening to find a way forward in a multipolar world where we do recognize that China is different from us, but we can cooperate in, in certain respects, certainly on climate. That would be one uh, that is uh, obvious. We can't uh, uh, improve our climate situation if the whole world isn't in. And another one to add is uh, some kind of guardrails around AI. I mean, that's a conversation mm -hmm. that's uh, uh, very, very important. And I was just uh, hearing that there's going to be a, a classified briefing of the entire Senate on, on AI. And I think that's a very good, th good initiative by the intelligence community. Congresswoman, thank you so much for your time. We look forward to your uh, engagement you. as well, your address to Congress tomorrow. Jane Harman, chair of the Commission on the National Defense Strategy. Coming up, our political panel will be here to discuss former New Jersey Governor Chris Christie planning to jump into the race for 2024 and take on Trump. This is Balance of Power on Bloomberg TV. Now, keeping up to date with news from around the world, here's the first word. I'm John Hyland. In France, unions are holding a fresh day of strikes against Emmanuel Macron's pension reform. It's the first nationwide protest in more than a month, and it will test whether the president has succeeded in getting much of the country to move on from the politically damaging fight. Macron has faced down months of protest and strikes after he angered many when he enacted legislation without a full vote in parliament. Prince Harry was in a London courtroom today to testify against a tabloid publisher he accuses of phone hacking and other unlawful snooping. Harry claims the publisher of the Daily Mirror used unlawful techniques to get scoops, which the company denies. Harry is the first senior British royal since the 19th century to face questioning in a court. And Boeing will delay deliveries of its 787 Dreamliner after uncovering flawed parts in recent days. It's a setback as the plane maker works to meet soaring demand for its long-range aircraft. Boeing says the flaw may affect about 90 already built Dreamliners that haven't yet delivered, as well as a handful of planes on its final assembly line in North Charleston, South Carolina. Global News, 24 hours a day on Darren on Bloomberg Originals. Powered by more than 2,700 journalists and analysts in more than 120 countries. I'm John Hyland, and this is Bloomberg. Let's dispel with this fiction that Barack Obama doesn't know what he's doing. He knows exactly what he's doing. He is trying to change this country. He wants America to become more like the rest of the world. We don't want to be like the rest of the world. We want to be the United States of America. That's what Washington, D.C. does. The drive-by shot at the beginning with incorrect and incomplete information, and then the memorized 25-second speech that is exactly what his advisors gave him. That was former New Jersey Governor Chris Christie and Florida Senator Marco Rubio going head to head during the GOP debate in 2016. Now, Christie has filed his paperwork to enter the race for 2024 with an event tonight in New Hampshire. For more, let's bring in our political panel, Lisa Camusa Miller, Reset Public Affairs partner, and Kevin Walling, former Biden campaign surrogate. Also key to this discussion this <laughs> evening is they both hail from the Garden State. <laughs> so right. you know we're dealing here with uh, Mr. Chris Christie. Lisa, let's start with you because I know you know a lot of members around his team is driving this campaign. How difficult is it going to be for him to attract Republicans in the sense that he was a Trump acolyte and then he bashed them? So isn't he almost despised on both sides? 
He was uh, not for Trump, and then he was with Trump, and now again he is <laughs> running on the platform that he is not Trump, and he's willing to take a shot. And if you've watched Chris Christie at all in the last 15 years of his public service, he is a man who is willing to take a shot and call call it. Like he did with uh, Rubio there. Very much like he did with Rubio. Very much like he kept... Uh, he, but he also is a party man, and he's somebody who, when Trump was the president, he was loyal, and he was uh, a surrogate, and he helped train him for debates. But I think what's different now is that he's ready to take a shot more than anyone else. He's going to call out... No one is fact-checking um, Donald Trump in a way that Chris Christie will do that. And so that, I think, will be interesting. Whether or not voters are ready, to, there are more voters that are willing to take a chance on someone other than Donald Trump if they're given a good alternative. Mm -hmm. We wanted to bring everyone back to 2016, uh, Kevin, because that's the Chris... Please know, as the Democrat, let's not go back to 2016. We're, well, we're going to go back to that <laughs> night, because that's the Chris Christie that people are saying would be the kamikaze candidate. Just get him up on a stage, kill Donald Trump. We'll find out later what happens. Just get Trump out of the race. Now, of course, we don't know that Donald Trump will even attend these early debates. He's already questioning that openly. But it, 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 do you see it that way as a, as a so-called kamikaze candidacy or a former governor who actually wants to be president? Well, and I think, Joe, to your question, too, it's anyone's guess if he can actually make that debate stage. Lisa and I were talking about this before in terms of the requirements set out by the RNC. He really struggles with small-dollar donors within the GOP base. Mm -hmm. And we're seeing a lot of those numbers out there. He has the highest uh, disapproval rating among any of the Republican candidates out there. So he is out there saying he will not be that kamikaze uh, candidate, uh, but all indications are that he wants this fight with Donald Trump. He learned mm -hmm. from 2016 that attacking others in that field isn't going to take out uh, that leader, and that's how Donald Trump was able to successfully win that primary mm -hmm. just uh, six years ago. When you look at small donors, is that the 30 percent hold that the former president has, what many would call the quote-unquote MAGA of the group? Yeah, and I, and I think what you're seeing, too, is, you know, Donald Trump really investing right now uh, with his campaign in that small-dollar donation, uh, uh, you know, focus. Uh, and he's spending heavily on Facebook now that he's back on in social media uh, to raise those uh, dollar amounts set out by the RNC because of that. You've talked to us uh, on Bloomberg before, Lisa, about Chris Christie being kind of the original Donald Trump. Yep. We wouldn't have Donald Trump if it weren't for Chris Christie creating that so-called tell-it-like-it-is mold. I know that's the name of his super PAC now, so I have to be careful. <laughs> but, but to what extent does that inform his attack on Donald Trump, and does it give him the upper hand somehow if they're actually face-to-face? -face? Well, I like to think that it does, because when you listen to Donald Trump talk, a lot of it is... Um, it's a little loose, if you will, right? There's not a lot of facts involved, for mm -hmm. lack of a better way to put it. And what I like about Chris Christie is he really does cut through a lot of that nonsense and calls up what the facts really are. And that, I think, of all the strategists that I see on these campaigns, mm -hmm. the team that he is assembling are amongst the best Republican operatives I know. They are some of the sharpest. They know how to build a campaign in a way that, that others perhaps haven't in the past. And I think that they're going to help. The, the governor doesn't need anyone to tell him how to be Chris Christie. Chris Christie is as authentic a candidate as any candidate in this race. <laughs> and that, I think, also makes it very interesting to watch. Does he have or could he have national appeal, though? Well, it's a challenge, Anne-Marie. I mean, I think more than anything else, there is a real lack of leadership on in any of these candidates because they're not willing to call out the facts, to call out why Donald Trump would not be the right candidate. So I'd like to think that Chris Christie could make that appeal by being someone who says, this is not the truth, here is the truth. But look, we're long past 16. We're into 24 now. And that alone means that the rules are different, what works is different. And so everyone's going to have to be really smart and on their toes and figure out how it is they cut through the noise mm. that comes from the Trump campaign. So you're taking this campaign seriously, obviously. Is it safe to say that you are not? <laughs> I think it sounds like you're about to go work for it. I'm not going to work for any campaign. All right. <laughs> but I will say that I do like, I do like authenticity. Yeah. I mean, as a trainer, as a communications person who does this every single day, I always train people to be as authentic as you can be because that is what makes you most likable. Be your true self. And there is no candidate in this field, to me, that's more authentic than a Chris Christie. I don't know, Kevin. You guys need to get together and talk this out, I think. We absolutely should. That New Jersey connection. Listen, I mean, the guy came in 10th in Iowa, 6th in New Hampshire. He's betting it all seemingly on New Hampshire with this announcement today. Yeah. So we'll see how it goes. We shall. Coming up with our panel, the PGA and Saudi-backed Live Golf agree to a shock merger. We'll be back with our panelists to talk about that and more. This is Balance of Power on Bloomberg TV.
I plan on being a PJ. <laughs> and we thought he just wanted to ride a bike. The president today responding to the big news. Shocked a lot of us when we saw it on the terminal, the PGA and Live Golf announcing today that they are joining forces. For more, we turn it to the panel. Our political panelists, Lisa Camuso Miller, Reset Public Affairs partner, and Kevin Walling, the former Biden campaign surrogate. Kevin, so much for Saudi Arabia being the pariah of the world. What does this tell us and how far we have come? with this relationship since the start of this administration? Well, Joe, it really took everyone by surprise, including the PGA players. They're up in Toronto as part of, the, I think, the RBC tournament that kicks off uh, this week. The commissioner was up there, the PGA Tour uh, commissioner, and he's got a lot of players that are blowing back uh, this announcement. Uh, you saw you know, Tony Blinken in Saudi Arabia uh, on, just yesterday, or actually today. He flew out uh, yesterday. Yeah. Uh, so I think there's a reset going on seemingly with <laughs> the Saudis uh, he was Blinken. I was with Blinken yesterday, and he was talking about the need to reset with, obviously, with Israel. But I think there's implications for the United States as well in these conversations. Well, when you look at what's going on with PJ and Lib, I mean, this was a huge fight that mm -hmm. these two were having. And then people didn't want to go to Saudi Arabia because of the concerns about human rights, et cetera. Could all of this and also the money they're spending in soccer actually move how the West feels about the kingdom? Well... I don't know. <laughs> this was so shocking, and the contours of this deal are so still behind the scenes mm. that I think there are a lot of questions to be asked. I think it would be impossible for people not to feel like this is just a gigantic betrayal, especially to the players who st stayed with PGA yeah. and didn't make that move. I had somebody smart enough to say to me today that this is like Donald Trump kissing Hillary Clinton on the mouth, <laughs> that this was just a blatant, like, wow. disrespectful uh, act. Uh, so I, I don't know, Anne-Marie. It seems very hard to believe. I mean, the families, the 9-11 families, oh. are up in arms, rightfully so, about yeah. this agreement. There's a lot to be uncovered here. Well, let's get back to what the president said then. I know that was a flip remark, but was he actually making a bit of a statement there? I mean, I think it was a joke. I, I don't know if he had joke. actually been read into the, the uh, conversations in that cabinet he's not meeting. Taking that, sides that off it too. I doubt he's... I think he stands with the PGA, certainly. Well, yeah. Uh, and has concerns about the Saudi Arabia's regime. Uh, one of the first acts that he did was to uh, put out a lot of that information about Jamil uh, Kashkogi's murder yeah. uh, at the hands of the Saudis. So I think it's a delicate balance with the Saudis, certainly, and OPEC and, uh, and all of those kind of global ramifications with yeah. through the lens of well, uh, a say, golf tournament. Marie, it's not keeping them from cutting production levels. No, it's yeah. not, but it's not working. They need higher prices for their Vision 2030, yeah. for everything they want to do with transforming this economy. Live is almost part of that, and they're not getting that with these mm. production cuts, um, which has a lot to say about potentially what's going on in demand, Indeed. but also they could also irk the administration, which I think took this in very chill, but they could irk the administration for continuing cut production. Certainly. There's one thing about this PGA Live, though, tour that is also very political. The former president said it's big, beautiful, glamorous deal, but his <laughs> courses have hosted several Live golf yeah, events. Right. Do you think that could backfire him, on him? Or now is potentially there more cover because PGA is involved? Mm. Maybe more cover. I think that's kind of the first reaction I had was that it gives him more cover and it lets him look like he was uh, a visionary. But in fact, I think this is the sports washing of, of, of the Saudis and how they feel about America. They, I think they are anticipating that we're not sophisticated enough to understand and perhaps that this is the way to go. Mm -hmm. yeah. So we're going to see a, a major tournament at Doral in the middle of the presidential campaign? <laughs> we will certainly see. But, you know, I think to your point originally, too, you know, the investments that they're making in buying soccer teams, Formula One, yeah. Uh, to Lisa's point, it is this kind of washing of their human rights uh, records and abuses over time through the lens of sports. And I think they're making a real gambit that they can change hearts and minds through sports in order to, to make that difference. Well, we'll certainly be keeping an eye on this one. Thanks to our it. political panel, Lisa Camusa miller and Kevin Walling joining us from the Garden State. Check out the Washington Edition <laughs> newsletter on the terminal and online for more of these stories. The great New Jersey summit today. <laughs> Thank you for joining us on Balance of Power. We'll see you back here tomorrow. This is Bloomberg.